He's been a force in Canadian theatre for decades as an award-winning director and playwright and as a founder and longtime artistic director of Buddies in Bad Times Theatre. Scott Gilbert also published several novels, books of poetry, and currently teaches English and theatre studies at the University of Guelph. His latest work currently on stage is Who's Afraid of Titus? that extends his exploration of Shakespeare, queerness, and the power of language. And Sky Gilbert joins us now. Hi. Hi. It's very nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you too. Uh, let's start with a question you pose in your new play, Who's Afraid of Titus? Does art harm us? Well, I think that this question, which has only recently been raised, is a very dangerous one because art is, uh, makes us uncomfortable, like actual art as opposed to entertainment. And don't get me wrong, I love entertainment, but we need art now and then. Mm -hmm. And art is always challenging. It can upset us, it can make us frightened, it can make us, Greek tragedy, I imagine when people went to see it, they were sobbing and wailing and they were going through what was called catharsis at the time. That was, that's what theater is about, is putting us through something mm -hmm. and making us, may, maybe we rethink our lives. I don't know, but it's tough, uh, uh, not just fun, right? That's the way it should be. So when people start going, I, I found that harmful, what you, what you presented, the play or the poem or whatever, then what you're doing is you're stopping artists from being artists. They're well, stopping them from doing what they do, yeah. You know, you mentioned um, comfort, right? Um, yes. What, what do you think we can learn about ourselves when we are uncomfortable? Well, it just depends on the person. Um, but I mean, I would say the problem for me, I think we all have something to learn, we can admit that. And I think that when I go into a play or I read a novel and it's only for uh, feeling I'm confirmed in who I am and what I do with my life and how I, I'm right, I'm great. Like if you go to see Fly Away or what's that? Come dreadful away musical <laughs> that they did come from away. The musical about how wonderful white it's people dreadful? are. Well, it's a dreadful, boring thing about how wonderful white people are. But at any rate, um, it, that musical, the audience, the white people go in the audience to see them say, "Oh, we're wonderful. We help people in Newfoundland." Do you know what I mean? But it, it's maybe it's about community. Yeah, but but it, it, it but in my view, it, it, what uh, art would do is make you actually question because community is what's community like. Community is very—it's a wonderful thing, but it's also very complex, very difficult. It's not There's a monolith, arguing. right? Arguing, yeah. And that's what art would do. It would probably show you the other uh, fractures in the community in order to make us aware of the difficulties and the challenges. I, I imagine like uh, some of the stuff that we have uh, now, if you were to see it, um, I, I'm, I'm curious to know what you would think because your play, Drag Queens on Trial, was almost banned by Canada's revenue yes. uh, minister, Otto Jelenke, uh, yeah. in 1989. Yes. Uh, what was it like to be at the center of conversations about censorship in the 1980s? Well, I mean, I've always been an outsider and I realized that, I realized with trepidation when I first put this is a gay play or these is by, the, this is based on gay poetry or whatever in the early 80s. And so, and Drag Queens on Trial itself, just the title was a real challenge for people. At that time, drag queens weren't even allowed, my drag queens in the show weren't even allowed to go into gay bars because they were thought to be bad. All the guys were being macho at that time. Um, yeah, so I would say it was, but so I've always been an outsider is what I want to say. I've always known after I came out that I, I would be outside uh, and I and I very much accept it and I actually enjoy being in that position um, but it also I would say what happened later it happened with Jelinek and later was we began to the company began to solidify around me and other people who were crusading against homophobia and that's what the company became it became a, uh, a company for uh, gays and lesbians to speak out against uh, homophobia and to feel comfortable and at home to be there, but but yes, I mean it was fighting the it was fighting the homophobe because mm -hmm. Jelinek was exactly that. He was it, it, Rob Ford, who was a counselor, opposed Buddy's happening at uh, Twelve Alexander, where it is now, moving to Twelve Alexander, and those were people and for people from the Christian right who they didn't want us to have that theater there. I want to come back to Buddy's, but yeah. you said something that I I want to follow up to. Um, you said that you've been comfortable being an outsider. Yes. I think a lot of us spend so much of our time trying to figure out who we are and maybe try to find belonging. Um, why are you comfortable being an outsider? I don't know. I, I, I don't, I'm not with, uh, with, most, with some of the younger generation, and certainly the people just my age or younger. A lot of them are very comfortable assimilating, right? Now, the, the connection I do have with trans people, we're going to talk about trans people, I hope, is that um, I, they, they're, a lot of them really identify as outsiders. They go, I just don't feel like I'm a part of things, right? Um, and I'm a gay man, but I'm also an effeminate man, and I'm a drag queen, and I'm openly gay, and people know I'm gay. <laughs> like, it's the rings, it's the earring 
whatever. You can't hide it's the hands, right? You can't hide it. So, um, but aren't those stereotypes? Yeah, interestingly, stereotypes are there only for the reason that sometimes they're correct, and for the reason that people love them. You know, um, I would say that, uh, that no, of course, not all gay men are effeminate. But if I get into that whole thing, because of what we do in bed, because of the sexual acts, which I don't necessarily have to mention, I'll let you all use your imagination, the sexual acts that men engage with together, that makes them feminine because they are not, they're doing what women do, what women are supposed to do culturally. And, and same thing with women. Women are not, lesbians are not doing what they're supposed to do with men culturally. They therefore are masculine, even if they're feminine. Do you understand what I mean? It's a way we think, and it's a stereotype that comes up. And when there are, is the now and then feminine gay man, like me, um, <laughs> we confirm it. And, and we feel really outside. And sometimes we go, wow, that's what I'm going to be. And that's mm. what I did. I'm going to be flamboyant, because that's what sometimes we overlive up to um, our identities, in a way, <laughs> overcompensate. Is there safety in that? There is a lot of safety in it. It's, it's why we call ourselves queer. And it's why we say, I'm a fag. I say, I'm a fag. I have a book called Sad Old Faggot, a novel. And it's because, let's own that term, because I know that term of abuse is out there still. Well, I want to come back to buddies. Um, I have a picture for you here. <laughs> oh, um, so on the screen, we have a picture of you celebrating the 35th birthday of Buddies and Bad Times. Right. Uh, North America's largest gay and longest running and lesbian theater, which you co-found and directed for 18 years. In 2018, you severed ties uh, with Buddies and mm -hmm. Bad Times after mm -hmm. The theater canceled a reading of your play, Drag Queens in Outer Space. Uh, the cancellation came after you wrote and published two controversial poems to your public blog. Uh, in the second poem, you decry so-called wokeness, describing the ways in which woke people stereotype and shame uh, gay men. You face discrimination and stigma for being uh, gay, and you've been a vocal critic of some ideas in progressive conversations. So why criticize others? Well, I think criticism is great. It's called dialogue. It's called civil dialogue. We've lost the art of civil dialogue in our culture, which means you don't have to hate somebody because of their ideas, and you don't have to call them a Nazi, or you don't have to call whatever. All you have to do is sit down, hey, we don't agree. We're both human beings. Let's try to talk this out, right? I would say. But are you having one on one conversations or. Uh, well, I mean, I would say that it, it goes into the area of journalism also. Like, mm -hmm. it goes into the area of teaching and journalism everywhere, where people can be quite, should be comfortable being with people who have wildly divergent views as theirs. They can, they have a right to disagree, but where all the anger and the demonization comes in, for me, is a problem. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that what happened to me at Buddy's was, for me, I, I think it's very important to say this, I was the canary in the coal mine. What's happened is, is the idealized, Ideologization. I guess that, I'm not pronouncing that right, but art is becoming ideology. In other words, art is becoming politics. Now, it isn't. And uh, if you read the great theories of art from in historically, and if you just think about art, it comes from the subconscious. It comes from an irrational place. Artists don't know how they do what they do if they're real artists, right? They're in touch with something. This is something that sounds all hocus pocus. Mm -hmm. But that's what art is. An essay is an essay. A political stand is a political stand. Ideas are ideas. You cannot boil art down to an idea. And if you do, you reduce it to something that it is not meant to be. And if it can be boiled down to an idea, then it's not art. Like, in other words, if you can actually reduce it like that. So what happened to me was because something was filtered out of these essays. This is the idea you, that you're presenting here. This is an essay. It wasn't an essay, it was a poem, and it wasn't a political speech. Yeah, there were ideas in it, but who knows where I land on those ideas? Like, I mean, I know that sounds crazy. Yes, there was a criticism, definitely there was criticism of homophobia in the trans community, for sure. But I don't know how I feel about that even now. <laughs> like, it's such a complex issue. Do you right? feel like you were misunderstood? I feel that they were misunderstanding art and that that's a big problem. Artists will self-censor. Artists are afraid to create because they're being, they're having ideas picked out of their work and said, you said a bad thing. You shouldn't write that. You shouldn't say that. You cannot have art under those conditions. Mm -hmm. Art will stop. And that meaning the thing which we, which is so dark and so crazy, but so inspiring. Mm. Well, in an interview with Extra Magazine, you said that you left Buddies, the theater you co-founded in 1979 because, quote, I knew uh, Buddies wasn't a safe space for me anymore, so the best thing was to end my relationship with the company. Why didn't you feel safe? Well, because Evelyn Perry, and it was her personally, because <laughs> I have the email, can't, the artistic director canceled my reading. And it was, that's not, that's not what happened the way, and I had an opera coming up, a, a workshop from an opera, which I eventually did something else, somewhere else. 
But um, yeah, I didn't know what was going to happen next because basically the way theater should operate and publishers should operate is they should get behind the artists that they are, are behind, if they if they have, that they like that they're publishing. If they find at some point or they're producing, right? If they fi find at some point that the work isn't good for some reason, or the response isn't great, or they're not reaching anyone or whatever, of course they might choose to let them go or not work with them. But this was some you know a deal that I had that she had made with me, where I was very excited about for the 50th anniversary. And suddenly, what could happen? Anything I do could be canceled because of something I wrote somewhere? Um, that isn't the way a theater show. I know because I was an artistic director. I, I never would have treated my artists like that. Um, I imagine, too, that, you know, I think at the heart of all these conversations, it's about trying to understand uh, people's viewpoints and where they're coming from. Yep. And um, when I was thinking about this interview, I was thinking, you know, you've co-founded Buddies mm -hmm. in 1979. Mm -hmm. um, the ups and downs that you went through uh, mm -hmm. with the company, just society has changed so much within mm -hmm. the last uh, five decades. Oh, yeah. um, it must have been heartbreaking for you to leave. Um, it wasn't that heartbreaking because I left. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I left in 1990. That was what was so strange about the whole thing was I left in 1997. I handed the theater over to Sarah Stanley, who's a lesbian artistic director. And um, I uh, and I was I wanted to move on, which I did. I still did produce plays there. And I still had some connection with plays. I was asked back in about 2006 to produce plays uh, by David Oye. Um, I did so, so, but I wasn't a part of it anymore. And I, I, I was, and so when this thing happened, that, the first thing I said to Evelyn when it happened in an email, I never talked to her about it, was um, uh, if people don't like my article, tell them I'm crazy. <laughs> like, you know, I, I'm not the artistic director. I do a play there now and then. Mm -hmm. You don't have to agree with everything I say. Like, you know what I mean? And, and, but there was this strange thing that was starting to happen that is happening now, which was you have a responsibility as an artist to your public to answer what happens to them when they look at your work. No. Mm. Artists cannot have that response. They must not, that responsibility must not be put on them. Mm -hmm. I was not, I was just not going to take it. Of course you're responsible in the sense that you, your whole life, you're, you're, this is your work and it means so much to you and you're putting everything out there and you're becoming vulnerable in your work and it's totally scary and yes, that's all that, but you don't, you're not responsible for the mental health of the people who come to watch your work. That's, I don't mean to laugh but at that. I'm not laughing at mental health, but it's not up to you it's to take care of that. It's not up to you to say, uh-oh, maybe my work's too upsetting. If I'm remembering correctly, in um, the blog where you said you were leaving, mm -hmm. um, you said that the youth are the future. Yes. Um, and in 2020, you wrote and directed A Nice Day in the Park, a play yes. <laughs> uh, that revolves around a confrontation between a young trans man and an old, uh, older gay man. Mm -hmm. um, what do you see as differences between how younger and older queer folks talk about socio-political issues in their community. Well, that was a great experience, and I wish I could remember the name of the trans actor who was in that play with me, because he's a wonderful performer, and he's very successful now, so you'll find him on in a TV series. But at any rate, um, well, the difference is this. Well, first of all, I understand something about the young, even though I'm incredibly old now. I understand... You were the, young once. Yeah, pardon me? You were young once. Yes, and, but I understand that now they're under special pressure. So, like, they are... There's, they're, it's a horrible world, and they say it, people say it every day, but there's an environment, there's the, all these dictatorships, including the one that happened in the United States for a while. Um, there's all this racism, there's the environment, there's just a, it's just a bad scene. And there's economics, there's finances, there's getting a job. We all know. So I understand that they might be under some pressure and they might be a little bit desperate. Um, but th there's, there's a difference uh, that I think is bad in the way that young are dealing with the with uh, artists, uh, well, people, generally older. Uh, in my time, when I came in uh, to the Canada Council, I was invited to some early meetings as, like, the gay guy at the meetings. And I remember Eric Peterson saying to me, and I, I uh, Eric Peterson is a great Canadian actor, and I have great respect for him, and he didn't mean this in any way bad, but badly, but he said to me when I was on this uh, committee, Sky, I'm glad to see you here. Uh, you know, a lot of people in the, in the theater, they wouldn't go into Buddies without wearing a paper bag on their head, you know? And I was like, Wow. And, and he meant it very nicely, but he meant, you know, there's a lot of homophobia around. You know what I mean? Uh, but I, I didn't go to him and say, Eric, I'm here to replace you. I went and said, I would like a place at the table respectfully with the rest of you. Um, I'm afraid that nobody, young or old, wants to be told by some, have someone look in the eye and say, your day is over. Our day is here. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's a problem. And I think having a, and I realize it's very hard to get a place at the table because I've fought for a long time. Mm -hmm. And to this day, when I tell people I'm a professor and a PhD, they often say, they look at my hands and they look at, they, they know I'm a drag queen or whatever, and they go, 
good for you. Mm. That condescension is, is, is very strongly there. Somehow I made it through being this effeminate gay male to be uh, an, an openly gay man, to be a, a professor and a doctor. Uh, so yeah, um, that's my little statement about that, is that I, I think that there, uh, that's what I have to say. <laughs> it, um, is it being replaced? I don't think any one of us wants to be replaced. We, well, exactly. we all want to feel as if we yeah, have uh, part some value. Is yeah. there um, a little bit of hurt around that? Being I would say, oh yeah, I would say it's, it's, it's scary and it alienates. It alienates yeah. people. You might say, well, I'm mad. I, the young might say, I'm angry. I, I, and there's been such inequity and that I get that. And, um, but I, I also think that it, it's about saying, I want to have a place with you at the table. If, mm -hmm. you know, if you're someone I respect and if you're someone of talent. Especially if you built the foundation. Mm -hmm. in, oh yeah, right? that's for sure. Um, you know, I want to ask you, uh, kind of leads into the next question okay. because uh, privilege is a very uh, loaded word, I yes. think. Um, for me, I'm a fair-skinned uh, person of African and European descent, mm -hmm. and I understand that I can move in the world differently than someone who is darker. Right. What's your response to people who think you've rejected the privilege that, as a white gay man, uh, you have a certain privilege in the queer community? Well, I think that there's a big problem right now in that gay men, and it's the fault, well, first of all, I'll say all this is the fault of gays and lesbians, because what they've done in the last 20 years is they rejected gender. So they said, we're not about gender. You know, lesbians are, this is nothing to do with gender being a lesbian. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a feminine woman. I'm, I'm nothing particularly masculine and butch dykes are a little bit embarrassing. That's what I feel the lesbian community did in the last 20 years. With definitely gay men, I know for sure. They went, well, you know, you're not a fem, like what you were saying, we're not, gay men are not effeminate. We're not, that, that's a horrible stereotype. We're masculine. We're just like everybody else. So they took gender out of it in trying to assimilate. And then what happened was, is that now, of course, everybody's going, well, you're the same. You know, gays and lesbians are the same as everyone. You have children, you're, but we're not the same. There is a culture. Two men being married is different than a man and a woman being married. Men's sexuality is different than women's sexuality. And it's something which really needs to be talked about and discussed, uh, it needs to be discussed. And I, 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 so I think that um, when it comes to privilege, yes, I'm a white male. I was born with all sorts of privilege, absolutely. I'm a white male, middle-class guy. Um, I was an American, whatever that means. <laughs> hey, at now. one point, yeah. though, having a green card or an American passport, you were, yes. you know. Yes, well, I threw it in the garbage after Trump, I can tell you that. But, um, but yeah, um, for sure, but I had that privilege. And then, but for me, when I came out, it was a completely different world for me. Um, and, um, and, I, and I still think that's true. Like, I, do, I think it, that all these gays and lesbians are trying to assimilate. Um, it just, it, it, I don't know how to tell you, but parents still don't know what to do when their little boy plays with uh, dolls or when their little boy begins to indicate that they might be, uh, as they grow up, begin to have romantic and finally sexual uh, uh, you know, feelings about men. They don't, people still are upset by it. Also, we live in a bubble. This is TVO. This is Toronto. This is New Democrat territory. The world is incredibly homophobic, as it is transphobic, as it is, you know what I mean? And, it, and all sorts of things. So we, we, it's nice for us to imagine that we're, everything's fine and there's no homophobia left in the world. But there, and, I, and I encounter it all the time, anyway, in, in my life, mm -hmm. for sure. And, um, and I have managed, I'm good for me, to become a professor and a doctor. But um, you know, I know what the context is. And I know that at any moment, it could be pulled out. <laughs> that kind of thing began to happen at Buddies from people who I knew and, and thought I loved, you know, when that privilege was kind of taken away in the mm -hmm. sense that this is no longer your home. Do you think part of the problem is that maybe we look at the queer community as being a monolith? Oh, absolutely. Um, we we want to say it's one thing or another, right? Mm -hmm. Like we want to say all gay men are like this. And it's very true, there are con <laughs> conservative gay men. I've been writing plays about, um, about how dumb and awful gay, gay men are for a long time. That's mm -hmm. what I used to do. So that might indicate to you, like, I. I'm a gay man and I think gay men are wonderful in, in a lot of ways. But people are dumb and awful. And that's what writers have been writing about. And, and, and it, 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 it really it drives me crazy because people, people say, well, why can't you write about nice people? I don't think you want to see a play about nice people. I don't think art was intended to be about nice people from the dawn of art. Um, so, yeah, so I'm just saying I never was rah, rah, gay. I don't know, it's very weird. My own community always said, Sky, why are you so critical of the gay community? And that's because I knew that gay men, just like everyone else, are awful and stupid. There was a gay play we produced at uh, Rhubarb years ago. Um, by uh, David Roach and David Bateman called People Are Horrible Wherever You Go. 
I think that kind of, I know it's kind of negative, but it's just important to keep in mind. Hey, but. you know, I, I, I appreciate the truth because <laughs> I don't want to live in a bubble. Um, I want to bring it back uh, to Shakespeare in our final oh, moments. Um, what draws you to Shakespeare? Um, it's, it sort of happened in my later years. I mean, I did my thesis, uh, my PhD thesis on Noel Coward, and I, through the help of Michael Cobb, I, we invented a term, he kind of invented it, called the queer feminine, which was about this notion of a kind of feminine writing. Um, and I began to look at Shakespeare and go, I think this is a queer feminine writer. Now, this has nothing to do with the fact that um, whether or not Shakespeare's gay. First of all, there wasn't such a thing as gay at Shakespeare's time, in the sense of an identity of gay. There was all sorts of sexual acts of all sorts of kinds, as, as of always Like sodomy was against the law, yeah? Yeah, sodomy was the, was the crime, but sodomy also included very crazy other things. Um, but um, and it was also just a term of abuse, so it was it, it widely used. But um, but yes, they knew about the acts, they knew such things happened, but they didn't have something like I'm a gay man or something like that. But um, I do think that uh, I, I'm very interested. In, oh, so you asked me what what got me in, what got me interested in Shakespeare? Yeah, I mean, I would say first of all. For any writer, I think Shakespeare and, and even James Baldwin, there's a wonderful essay, as an essay, How I Learned to Stop Hating Shakespeare. I recommend it very, very much. But um, anybody, well, I think, he's just a, a very great writer. And there are lots of misconceptions about him. Um, I believe that Edward de Vere, the Earl of Oxford, I wanted to make sure I said this, I hadn't in the pre-interview, Edward de Vere is the real Shakespeare. And that will paint me as crazy if you don't already think I'm crazy out there. But yeah, and that has been an influence. But no, I'm in love with Shakespeare's writing. He teaches me how to write. Now, I would say the main thing he teaches me, you may have trouble stopping me here, the main thing he teaches me is that art is not didactic. I think Shakespeare learned his craft from Ovid, who was a Roman poet. And what he learned from Ovid was um, that art is, uh, not, does, is not meant to have a message. So people struggle you know, with the Merchant of Venice. They struggle with Othello. They struggle going, what is his message about this? Now, his message is kind of, people are horrible wherever you go. His kind of message is, life is tough. Um, it's about feeling those things. It's about working through them. It's about thinking about them and analyzing them. But it's, he's not going to tell you what position to take on anything. And finally, uh, I don't think that Tamio the Shrew is a misogynist play. I don't think so it is. So what is it? Oh, well, it's a play about poetry. Um, Petruchio is teaching her how to be a poet. He's being somewhat patriarchal. But by the end of the play, she becomes a better poet than Petruchio, and she outwits him. Mm. And if you, if you think Shakespeare was a misogynist, then what are you going to do about Cleopatra? What are you going to do about Rosalind? What are you going to do about uh, Lucrece, the, the rape of Lucrece, this woman? One of the most eloquent defenses of a woman who was raped, who at the time would have been accused of all sorts of things, um, in his poem, The Rape of Lucrece, or Lucrece. What are you gonna, what are you gonna make of that? No, you, 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 you anyway, so that, that's not an issue for me. I did wanna talk about one more thing about Shakespeare. What did you wanna ask me? I, <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to get it all we in. We should so switch seats now. talking a little bit too fast. <laughs> no, no. So trying uh, to get it all uh, in. I, 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 we were running out of time, but I, I have a few more questions to ask you. Um, what does it mean to queer a text? Well, I, I take this from um, a Canadian uh, writer, um, who, a, a philosopher who, in Vancouver, whose name I can't remember, but I, he's written a book, um, and it's um, all about um, uh, homoerotic space. And what he suggests is that you can create, um, we as readers, we as watchers, we as queer watchers, as trans, bi, gay, and lesbian watchers, we can see places in the work to put ourselves. And especially since lots of times the work does not have explicitly, it's straight work about straight romance. So we can put ourselves in there and we can do it whenever we want to. The thing about Shakespeare is that he invites us to do it quite often because boys are falling in love with boys, right, in his plays. And that had to do with Neoplatonism and a certain way of, it was a way of idealizing love. But then if you look at something like the sonnets, um, the in Shakespeare's sonnets, most of them are addressed to a young man, and some of those are extremely erotic. It's obvious Shakespeare was aware of the attraction, the male-to-male -male mm -hmm. attraction. And um, so um, now I've completely lost myself in my own Well, thought. no, because you mentioned um, that uh, there is some uh, literature with Shakespeare where he is talking about uh, queer uh, relationships. Yes. Can, more, can gay content be found in Shakespeare's plays? Yes, I would say, I mean, the two, two one immediately thinks of, I, well, The Merchant of Venice is the one which strikes me right away, but there's also some quite explicit in Twelfth Night. And Twelfth Night was originally based 
on an Italian farce that was kind of a gay farce. Uh, he kind of ungated a bit, but it's still based on that. But it's it's Twelfth Night. It's the relationship that Antonio and Sebastian have. I mean, he has two kind of gay characters. And the Sebastian, um, someone says of Sebastian about Sebastian and, other man, and another man, I think he loves the world for him. Mm. Think about that. It makes me cry, and that's one of the reasons I, I do uh, I do love Shakespeare. But it's because you know me thinks he loves or whatever is the world for him. So the reason why this you person yourself... loves the world is because of that person. Do you see yourself in his work then? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you're working a new book titled Shakespeare Lied, yes. which will be released in a few years. By Guernica. Guernica's um, can you give us a sneak peek <laughs> into what it's about? Yeah, um, the book is it has a little bit. It has a lot to do with the abandonment of the right brain. Um, I read a, a, a book by a book. That's how one book by Ian <laughs> Mag Ian McGilchrist called um, The Master and His Emissary, which I would recommend, and it talks about the abandonment of the right brain in our modern culture. And for me, this is the process. Yeah, this is the problem. So what it means is, for, and it's very simple, oversimplified, and a lot of science people are going to get mad at me, but there is a sense that there's a part of the brain that is more, which is the right brain, intuitive. And um, there's another part that is basically based with words and figures and, and, and um, logic. Um, and we're in a science world. We live in a world of science. My, my first book was called about Shakespeare. It was published by Guernica. It was called Shakespeare Beyond Science. And I believe that we have spirits, and we are spirits, and we need to nurture that. And we, are, we have, have lost that. And that it isn't just religion, but art, which especially now, since so many people have abandoned religion and are going to nefarious places like QAnon to <laughs> nurture nurture their spirit you know they need the spirit that art offers them which is uh, beauty and which is which is um the ineffable and the irrational and it feeds this part of ourselves that will never go away because we're not really rational beings we're beings who have to uh, have we need to be nurtured that part of us or else it can go very wrong sky it's been really nice having you on the show it's thank you so fun. much for your time thank and you. uh, hopefully you can come back when the book is out I would love to. Yeah. Wernicke would love it too. Thank you so much. <laughs> the Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.